Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able, with 10,000, to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The recent Olympics in Rio were inspiring, weren't they? It was incredible to watch Michael Phelps collect his 23rd gold medal. And I liked watching Katie Ledecky win her races by such staggering margins. I'm guessing those who swam against Ledecky thought to themselves, if I have the swim of my lifetime, I might win a silver medal. The gold was spoken for before Ledecky ever hit the water. It wasn't much different in gymnastics, where Simone Biles dazzled us with her incredible acrobatics. Didn't it seem as if she defied gravity when she leaped into the air? And what about Usain Bolt? For three straight Olympics, fastest man on the planet. Over the last 12 years, he lined up nine times to win the gold he never lost. Incredible. And I can't forget those athletes who came from developing countries. Those who didn't have the latest technology or a high paid coach or a bank account that was adequate. Yet day after day they worked hard until they were able to perform on the world's foremost sports stage. The Olympics showcased many athletes who were inspiring and every time the Olympics come around, I always want to watch the decathletes. I just can't get over how somebody can be outstanding in the 100 meter, the 400 meter, the 1500 meter, the hurdles, and then be able to do the long jump, the high jump, the pole vault, throw a, throw a javelin, a shot put, a discus, just incredible. I was watching these Olympics with my grandson, and as we watched them, I reminded him that these athletes were not born with extraordinary ability. None of them were born superhuman. To reach the Olympics, they had to make hundreds of sacrifices along the way. To truly excel, you have to show up at the pool at 6 a.m. and dive into the water even when it's freezing. You have to lace up your shoes and hit the road, go for a long run when it's in the 90s. You have to go to the gym and you have to pump weights while your friends are off at the movies. Olympians talked about missing weddings, birthdays, and vacations, and spending countless hours away from those they love. They made numerous personal sacrifices in order to excel. They had to be resolute in their determination to stay on task when they were at the top of their game and when the wheels fell off. Many begin with high aspirations. 
but they fail to persevere when obstacles arise. They simply do not have the resolve to keep forging ahead. In today's passage, Jesus speaks of an unyielding resolve worthy of Olympians. He's still many miles away from Jerusalem, and a large entourage is walking along with him. He believes that many of those who've thrown in their lot with him don't really comprehend the commitment that's required. So to clarify, Jesus jars them with this abrasive language. His business in Jerusalem is going to be very dangerous. He is calling for devoted recruits, not ardent admirers. He needs followers who are fiercely determined to give him their undivided loyalty. Today's text immediately grabs us by using the word hate. According to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus describes the ferocity of commitment he requires with this short four-letter word. A severe word that produces an intense response. If a child boils with anger and screams at his sister, I hate you, mom jumps in quickly, we don't use that word. You're mad at your sister, and I understand that, but you don't hate her. We don't hate anyone. We hate terrorism. We hate heroin. We hate racism. We hate those things that destroy. Unless a parent has abused you, we don't talk about our relationship with our parents in terms of hate. And almost no parent would say that he hates his son or daughter. Disappointed, maybe, but extremely unlikely that anyone would say, I hate my child. Yet according to the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister, even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Jesus really didn't grasp the concept of marketing, did he? <laughs> Wouldn't it have been better if he'd had a nice little green gecko to talk to people? <laughs> or paint a vision of everyone grabbing the hands of those next to them and forming a human chain that wraps around the globe? Why didn't he go for heartwarming? rather than offensive? Why not some uplifting music, catchy jingle? It's amazing he didn't run off every single person and bring his movement to a halt on that day. Now, of course, Jesus is not demanding that we literally hate the members of our family. He was employing one of his favorite figures of speech, hyperbole to drive home his point that our ultimate loyalty should be to God. We can witness what happens in families who routinely rank family outings and children's sports higher than they rank church. Priorities get out of line. Children can grow up with the notion that the most important thing in life, sports. Church is where we talk about the things that matter most in life. This is where we get our lives in perspective. This is where we talk about the things that can tear us apart where we gain our greatest strength when storms blow in, where we learn the necessity of patience, forgiveness, where we discover guidelines 
and guidance when we have very difficult decisions to make. Where we catch a vision of the kind of world God wants us to create and where we find the true foundation of lasting hope. If Christ is first, all other relationships are strengthened and nourished. If family is first, then the ties are not as vibrant and robust as they can be when Christ is in our homes. In today's passage, Jesus not only uses this shocking language of hatred to declare how our priorities ought to line up, he also counsels us to carefully consider our commitment that he wants us to make. Jesus says, for which person deciding to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether or not he has enough to build the tower. Otherwise, when he has a foundation, he runs out of money and is not able to finish, and all begin to ridicule him. He started to build, but he didn't have enough to finish. Again, Jesus seems determined to thin the crowds that are following him. Before you jump on board with me, he says, sit down and assess the cost. If you fail to calculate your commitment, you might not be able to see it through. Later this afternoon, I'm going to do a wedding, and when people decide to get married, they know that it requires a lifelong commitment. They will make their vows in a very special public ceremony, but before arriving at the altar this afternoon, they have already thought long and hard about the commitment that they're willing to make. Shortly before the episode in today's passage, Jesus decided to head to Jerusalem. He had been walking around in the Galilean countryside and his teaching and healing had been attracting people like dual magnets. He had attracted so many people. The Gospels were saying great multitudes were walking along with him. But when Jesus felt God was compelling him to go to Jerusalem, his demeanor seemed to flip. Jerusalem, he knew, was the seat of his adversaries, the leaders who were in collusion with Rome and oppressing most of the people. Jerusalem would be very dangerous. He and those connected to him would face a firestorm. Now, living in the 21st century in the United States, our context is very different than those first followers of Jesus. Yet, I believe the cost of discipleship still runs high. God expects us to commit our time, our attention, our minds, our skills, our money to the church, to following Jesus. American Dan Clendenin taught in Moscow for four years. One day, a young woman in one of his classes said that she had met a missionary from the U.S. while riding on the subway. He asked, would you like to become a Christian? If you will affirm these four statements in this booklet and say a prayer, then you're a Christian. It's that easy. She declined and told her professor later that afternoon, you people from America think that being a Christian is easy. We in the Orthodox tradition know it's difficult. You bet it's a lot more difficult 
than just believing certain statements about God and Jesus. Jesus was constantly calling people to action. Rather than believing certain propositions, his emphasis was on how we live our faith. Today's text reminds us that even though committing our lives to Christ brings meaning and purpose and joy and hope, it also requires sacrifice and commitment. How could it be any other way? To overcome personal cravings like greed and lust, to overcome personal shortcomings like anger and arrogance, you must give yourself to something beyond yourself. You must give yourself to something that is noble and true. You relinquish the constant focus on your small self and grow into your greater self when you commit to the way of Jesus. God knows that following the path of Jesus isn't easy. It requires courage and commitment, stamina and spunk. But since these are the very things that bring zest to life, why would we opt for anything else?